I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. We will take you live to the House of Representatives, where the House passed a bill that would keep the government open for two weeks beyond Friday's shutdown deadline on a vote of 235 to 193. The bill passing today after House Speaker Paul Ryan squashed a rebellion among conservatives, demanding a longer stopgap bill. The short-term measure now heads to the Senate. Again, that goes through December 22nd. Minnesota Senator Al Franken confirms today that he will resign in the coming weeks. More than half of his Democratic colleagues, including several women, demanded he step down after multiple allegations of sexual misconduct. A shooting at a New Mexico high school left two students and the suspect dead today. Schools throughout the small town of Aztec were closed for the day. Police have not released any details about the shooter, but confirmed the other two people killed did attend the Aztec high school. President Trump signed a proclamation today at the White House for the National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day on this, which is the 76th anniversary of the attack. The president was joined by six veterans at the White House, saying our nation pauses to remember Pearl Harbor and brave warriors who on that day stood tall and fought for America. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Qualcomm CEO opens up for the first time on the Broadcom takeover and dismisses the $105 billion bid, a potential record for the tech sector, as a lowball offer. Plus, Bitcoin breaks another barrier, roaring past $16,000 for the first time. But as the gains rise, so do the concerns. And America's AI addiction continues to hit home. Our exclusive interview with Amazon Vice President and Alexa head scientist Rohit Prasad. But first to our lead. Qualcomm CEO Steve Mollenkopf speaks publicly for the first time since Broadcom offered $70 a share for the chip maker. He sat down with Carlyle Group co-founder David Rubenstein at the Economic Club of Washington and weighed in on Broadcom's offer. There's not much more I can say than what was in the press release, which essentially is we didn't think that the... Uh, the offer was in the ballpark of, of value, and there's a lot of uh, uncertainty or at least uh, unknown timing related to uh, regulatory. And, you know, if you look at our board, just speaking as, as one person, um, you know, it's a pretty strong board. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Ian King, who covers the company. This is the first time we're hearing from Steve Molenkov personally. Is this just a negotiating tactic? I mean, who knows? I mean, he's very careful to say at the end of this, if we get value, if we get an offer, um, but he has to say that, right? Mm. He has to, on behalf of his company's board, say that if the right amount of money comes along, we'll look at that. So what do you think is the significance of the fact that he has now personally yeah. said, not in the ballpark? Well, he went on in that presentation to talk at length about the way he sees his company running into the future, how it's going to get through all of these issues that it has faced and, and you know, that have got its stock price to the low point that it is at the moment. You've been covering the chip industry for years and years, mm. Ian. So what is your hunch on how this plays out? It's, it really depends, again, on, on a number of variables. They also talked about NXP, the Dutch company that Qualcomm is actually trying to buy itself. And has been right for now. 14 months, right? Ex exactly, right. If they can get that done, then that puts them in a much stronger position. Mm. If they could also get some sense that some of these legal battles, say with Apple, are coming to a conclusion in their favor, much stronger position, Broadcom has to probably up it so or offer beyond the range of what it's good at. What's the do. timeline for potentially closing the NXP yeah. deal when it hasn't closed for over a year? Right. Uh, Malenkov talked about that today and said, look, by the end of the year, we're kind of hopeful, but maybe early in next year. Again, if that happens, then that puts him in negotiation land with NXP shareholders. The pressure's on him to close, the pressure's on him to pay more, which he also talked about today. Said there would be discussions if he found himself in that situation. And then what about the situation with Apple? I mean, that has only gotten more antagonistic. So, I mean, do you expect yeah. a resolution there? I mean, it, it seems like just when they've you know, uncovered every stone in the legal world to throw at each other, then they find something else. I mean, we had them suing each other for new patents that they found 
you know, as recently as last week. So it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. All of the analysts and investors say Apple has no incentive at all to not drag this on. Meantime, what's Broadcom saying? No backing down, right? No, I mean, as we know, they, they put those directors out there and said, look, we think that these people are a better position to take this whole company forward. That's a bold statement. He said, Malenkov said today, why would you do that? That's, a, that's not really a, a friendly maneuver. That's not really a, an approach that we understand. So clearly, you know, they're upping the stakes and it's not looking like a very conciliatory approach at this point. The earnings yesterday were strong, yeah. uh, but they do paint a view of the future but don't put a timeline on, on when that future arrives in yeah. terms of uh, when they will see increased yeah. margins and all of that. Explain. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the numbers were, uh, as they have been over the last few quarters for Broadcom, much better than expectations, and they said they're going to get better as well. But they kind of damped down a little bit of the enthusiasm and said, but hold on a minute, we're only going to grow 5% long term. Right? So... When, when, what does long term mean? Yeah, exactly. Well, this has been the view, you know, this is their competing view of the semiconductor industry, which is we're a 10%, a 20% growth industry over time. All of these new opportunities, cars, whatever, 5G, the Qualcomm view. And they're saying, no, hold on a minute. Even though we're doing well now, don't get carried away. This is about consolidation. This is about getting the most profitability out of what we're good at. All right. Well, I know, Ian, you will keep us posted on all uh, the latest. Ian King, who covers the chip industry for Bloomberg Tech. Thank you. Another top story of the moment, we continue to track the price and the frenzy around Bitcoin. Bitcoin had one of the wildest sessions ever, crossing the 16,000 mark. This just three days before CBOE Global Markets, one of the world's biggest regulated exchanges, debuts futures on the cryptocurrency. RBS chair Howard Davis spoke to Bloomberg Surveillance about what's perceived as a Bitcoin bubble. I'm afraid that this is um, uh, irrational exuberance. Um, this is, uh, as Greenspan's famous phrase, um, of course, he then found that uh, the market kept on going up after he said it should stop. But, you know, this is a very, very unusual market. This shows we're not in a normal two-way trading market that, uh, you know, you normally have. Even at the bi in the biggest rises, you've got some people trading in and out. So we're in, a, we're in very unusual territory here. And I'm not sure, frankly, I mean, it's a great chart, uh, Tom, but I'm not sure that normal rational market analysis can really illuminate this terribly right. well. Sir Howard Davies, you are the most qualified person in the world to talk about derivatives in Wall Street. You founded FSA. You made regulation <laughs> work in the United Kingdom. Should CME and the CBOE, should the American derivatives market make a formal market in this thing that we're seeing on this chart right now? I think I would uh, counsel them not to at this point. Uh, because I'm not quite sure that they know enough about what the underlying is, about the nature of the supply and demand of the underlying asset. So I think it would be a very risky move in reputational terms for them to go in that direction now. But, but actually, if there are futures, and we're, you know, we're understanding that, for example, the uh, CFTC are looking at you know, stress tests, limits, and, and actually a lot of the clearing before the, these contracts are given the green light. But could futures put an end to Bitcoin if, if it doesn't go well? I suppose, I suppose it could, but I just don't know how you would price a future at this point. I mean, maybe there's someone smart enough uh, to do it, but the normal way in which you'd price a future, I think, would be very, very difficult to adapt to this, uh, this instrument. How, how do you see blockchain developing? And this was one of your earlier points, yes. is that if, if nothing happens with Bitcoin, then actually the underlying technology could be used in other ways. Yeah, no, I think blockchain is uh, much more interesting. Um, I mean, again, people, some banks, uh, and ours is one, is, you know, a bit cautious about about, about the security uh, of it, um, but I do think that the uh, the idea of distributed ledger, um, which makes transactions, payment systems, much cheaper and faster in real time, is a is a good one. So blockchain, I think, has got life in it. That was RBS Chairman Howard Davies. Coming up, last month Autodesk announced it is restructuring its business to focus on the cloud and subscription services. We'll hear from Autodesk CEO Andrew Anagnost next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.
General Electric announced pan plans to slash 12,000 jobs in its power business, or about 18% of the unit's workforce. The decision means GE has taken the lead among U.S. businesses in announcing the most job cuts this year, totaling nearly 20,000. The move is part of new CEO John Flannery's plan to eliminate $3.5 billion of expenses across the company by the end of the year. Well, software firm Autodesk recently announced an aggressive restructuring plan to prioritize its subscription services. It also cut more than 1,000 jobs. While the company said this could streamline its business, the stock tumbled dramatically on the news. Our Bloomberg TV editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, is standing by with the CEO of Autodesk. Corey? And DIM Emily, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Anagnos joins us right now uh, all, from all the way across the street. All the way across the street. Um, I, I think Autos is such an interesting company, uh, both in what the products do and the ways that you sell it, but also in the way now that you're changing the business. Uh, first, can you describe the markets that are most important to Autodesk right now? Yeah, so you know, there, there are several markets that are core to us. Obviously, the architecture, engineering market. Which has it, been which, the history of Autodesk. That, that's the history. We're also a big player in the product design and manufacturing space. What's becoming a super important emerging market is construction. You know, we've always been big in the A and E in AEC. Right. We're becoming very big in the C in AEC because that whole industry is digitizing. Well, and, it, and it's also interesting that, that in the procurement, you see uh, a, a lot of municipalities figuring out that if you work in procurement and design into the actual design process, you end up with a lot faster and a lot cheaper projects. Yeah, well, it, it's even, actually, Corey, it's even more, more, more than that. What's happening in construction is it's industrializing. Construction processes are starting to look a lot more like manufacturing processes. And you know how digital manufacturing processes are. Yeah. Construction's got to be exactly the same. So you guys are in the midst of this. You announced these big changes in the business model, or, or the, the, particularly the move from, from man, uh, maintenance uh, to subscription, yep. and, and how that's maybe a little bumpier than you would have thought. Uh, stock took a big hit last week, though in, in context, of about two years, you're still about 72% for, for a two-year stretch, which is a pretty good run. Yeah, it's a great run. And, you know, Corey, we, we announced great results because we, we hit all our goals, we, we exceeded a few. 5% sales growth year over year. Yeah, well, 25% recurring revenue growth. We are returned to revenue growth. So remember, we, we were you know, going through the dip, so we were right. negative for a while, now we've returned to revenue growth. We, we did exactly what we were said we were going to do. I just think people expected us to maybe do a little well, bit more. Why would a customer switch from maintenance to a subscription-based uh, uh, fee for your service as opposed to just abandon it and go somewhere else? Yeah, well, you, you know, I mean, you, you probably talked to a lot of these companies companies all the time. Most of our customers are seeing companies like Salesforce, Workday, they got Office 360. The way they buy software now is subscription based. It's kind of just the expectation. They like it, they can turn it on, turn it off when they need it. Most customers are saying, yeah, this is the way the software industry is going. So there's really not a lot of resistance, maybe from the smallest customers in our base, but not from the bigger ones. So I talked to a lot of people uh, getting ready to talk to you today about sort of what was going on and what they thought of the call last week and what the information was. And one of the, I kept hearing questions about the timing of the restructuring. Yeah. Why do the restructuring now, and what does it have to do with your long-term 2020 free cash flow goals? Yeah, it was interesting con conspiracy theories that were being. There were a lot out there. Well, yeah, yeah. well, you know, it's uh, it's. And I'm, and I'm a collector of conspiracy and, theories. I'm a big fan. Yeah, and, and that that was there was a lot of ones around that. So you know, one of the things you know, you know, there's that famous John F. Kennedy quote, right? The best time to fix your roof is when the sun is shining. Right. That's exactly what we've been doing. We've been planning this for a while. We knew we needed to invest invest more strategically in digitizing the company, and in particular in construction. The money just wasn't in the places we needed it. So this is something we planned. We're going to invest every penny back in the company over the next six to 12 months. So this, this isn't a reduction in our OPEX envelope. It's just a reshuffling of where we're spending the money. So what does that mean for headcount? Is headcount going to end up the same here? We'll be as, headcount wise, we'll be as big a company a year from now as we, we were before the restructure. So where, where do those resources have to be? Where were they maybe in the wrong place and where are they going to be now? Well, what we did is we had a bunch of initiatives that weren't core to what we were trying to do. You know, driving the subscription transition, digitizing the company, becoming a super modern digital company, reimagining construction and manufacturing. We had projects that just weren't aligned with that. So we, we essentially took out entire projects and we're shifting the money over to those things that are important. I think the other thing that, that I heard back a lot was that uh, there's a concern over the subscription number, just how many uh, customers are, are joining the subscription service. Talk to me about uh, you know, what, what, the, what the story is there, what you expect it to be. You know, I now. think that was the biggest piece of turbulence from last right. week because we delivered a solid solid result on the core, which is really sure. what matters. You can't deliver the rec recurring revenue growth without the core strength, but, when, when, but when, we took when, the cloud number down. When analysts are modeling the stuff out, though, you get down to a unit number, yep. and you get down to a revenue per subscriber, 
of maintenance per subscriber. And so when those numbers come down, the, particularly when you're switching to a recurring revenue uh, model, that starts to matter a lot more. Yeah, but see, the re that's, that, that's here's the exciting thing, though. The revenue per subscriber on the subscriptions that matter is up 20% year over year. So what they got spooked by, and it's natural because, you know, it's a complex transition. People wonder, hey, what's sure. going on under the covers? We just said we're going to do fewer cloud subscriptions, and those cloud subscriptions aren't important to our two-year goals. Why? That's what spooked them. Because they're small relative to the core, so the cloud's growing small fast. Number or small, small number or small in terms of revenue, revenue per customer? Small revenue Small revenue number. Small revenue per customer, too. Okay? But they're going to be bigger three, four, five years out. They're just small relative to the two-year goals that everybody's paying attention now, to. Now, what does it mean for sort of product development, innovation, and the kinds of things you want to innovate around? Actually, in terms of what? What we've just done with the restructure? No, I think more in terms of your investment, we're going to focus investment. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What, what it means is we're going to be investing a lot in reimagining how people do construction and manufacturing processes. You know, you know, you probably know this. Construction is the lowest invested in IT right next to agriculture in the U.S. I think in Europe it's actually below agriculture. Th this industry needs to be transformed and it's investing crazy in digital technologies now. So when you look forward, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be helping our construction com com customers become manufacturers of buildings. Well, I think, that's an I think exciting opportunity. Everyone watching this right now or listening to this right now is can look out in the major cities in this country. I, was, I ran down by where they're cranes. building. Cranes everywhere. Yeah. The, the new Warriors facility, I counted nine cranes down there this morning. There's cranes all over downtown San did, Francisco. Did you know that on average, 30%, uh, 30 to 40% of what you see on that site is wasted? Interesting. Well, uh, a great opportunity yeah. for you. Appreciate your time. Uh, glad to have you talking to us. Uh, Andrew Anagnos, the uh, CEO of Pleasure. Autodesk. Thank Emily, you, back to you. Thank you, Corey. Corey Johnson in the newsroom. Coming up, AT&T and the Department of Justice step inside a courtroom. What a federal judge had to say about the impending antitrust case next. And a feature I want to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. Find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. Watch us live. If you miss an interview, go back to it. You can send our producers a message. You can play along with the charts that we show you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only, so check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Disney is tapping into the tech world to expand its board. Safra Cat, CEO of software giant Oracle, and Francis D'Souza, head of Lumina, will join the board on February 1st. The expansion of the board coincides with talks Disney is holding to buy the entertainment assets of 21st Century Fox. CEO Bob Iger is scheduled to retire in July 2019, suggesting directors will have to be vetting possible successors next year. AT&T and the Department of Justice squaring off in court. A federal judge says the antitrust lawsuit will go to trial on March 19th of next year. The DOJ is trying to block AT&T's $85 billion takeover of Time Warner, claiming it would harm consumers with higher TV bills and fewer entertainment options. Bloomberg Intelligence's senior analyst for litigation, Jennifer Ree, joins us now. So, Jennifer, tell us what happened in the courtroom today. Well, you know, um, I wasn't actually in the courtroom today, but I did get a pretty good uh, rundown as to what went on, and the judge really didn't pull any punches and just came out and said, look, I'm setting March 19th as the trial date. This is in between what the companies had requested and what the Department of Justice had requested. It is quite a bit closer, though, to the parties, the company's date than the Department of Justice, and to me, it seems like an effort to try to do the best he can to work within their time frame, within their merger agreement. So what happens between now and the trial start date? Well, normally what would happen next is the companies would file an answer to the Department of Justice's complaint, but they jumped in and did that right away. So that's finished. So most of what's going to go on between now and then is additional discovery. That is the collection of data, documents, and deposition testimony of various people in the industry. Um, I know it, it's kind of remarkable that the Department of Justice might need to continue to do more discovery here when they've already been investigating for a year, but they have said there is more that they think they need in order to go to trial on this case. And, of course, the companies themselves haven't really engaged in that kind of investigation at all and will be seeking documents from the Department of Justice as well as possibly other third parties. How many days is the trial likely to last? 
Well, the judge here expect, said he estimated about three weeks, and I took a look at the last three trials in which the Department of Justice was challenging a deal, uh, the last one being about a year ago. It was, it was uh, the uh, uh, merger of two radioactive waste disposal companies, and in that case, the trial lasted um, just a couple weeks. I've, I've seen them last about four weeks, two weeks to four weeks. This judge estimated about three weeks, so right down in the middle. So is there a possibility that this case could settle before it goes to trial? You know, settlement talks can be ongoing at any time in any litigation. They can occur, you know, in the middle of trial. They can occur the eve of trial or right at the end of trial. In this case, uh, I imagine the, the Department of Justice and the companies may talk a little bit, but it just seems like they're at an impasse, and I'm not really sure how that impasse can be bridged. You know, if the Department of Justice is looking for structural remedy, as in selling off assets like Turner or DirecTV, and the companies are... are are only willing to engage in behavioral remedies, which would regulate their conduct after they've merged. I, I don't see what the, what the middle ground is there, and I, it doesn't look like a settlement can be reached. Now, Jennifer, I understand you have closely looked at arguments on both sides. Who's got the better case? <laughs> You know, my feeling still here is that the companies have the better case. I think the Department of Justice is sort of going against their own guidelines, going against, I, I wouldn't call it precedent because it's not technically precedent, but going against the practice of both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission for about the last 40 years in their treatment of vertical mergers um, and in their treatment of the pro-competitive effects of those mergers as well as the kind of remedies they enter. Where vertical deals like this one, which, which is not combining competitors, have raised antitrust harms in the past that's usually been remedied with behavioral conditions like the companies have offered in this case. So, you know, does that lead you to believe this is politically motivated? You know, I think that that is, is really just a difficult call to make, and, and I, I just can't say, because there is validity and, and feasibility in the Department of Justice's arguments. A vertical deals can raise the kinds of harms that the Department of Justice is alleging here. And it really comes down to what the economic analysis looks like, and, and you know, we'd really have to get into the weeds to understand that. Um, and, and we don't know what their economists have done and what those studies look like. But the, what they have asked is whether there's a long-term profitability whether we, it will be profitable in the long term for the companies to engage in a strategy where they withhold their content from other distributors, even if they take a short-term hit by doing that. So it's really going to come down to that economic analysis and what the company's documents say. All right. Well, I know you will keep us updated. Jennifer Ree, Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much for breaking it all down. We'll continue to follow. Thank you. Coming up, the holiday shopping season is underway as the fight for your living room heats up. We'll talk to the brain behind Amazon's Alexa on its new key features next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The House has passed a stopgap spending bill to prevent a government shutdown this weekend. The measure passed mostly along party lines. It would keep the government running through December 22nd. The Senate is expected to vote on the bill in the next few moments. The House vote came after President Trump and congressional leaders in both parties met to discuss a range of unfinished bipartisan bills business on Capitol Hill. A senior Palestinian official says representatives will not meet with Vice President Mike Pence during his upcoming visit to the region because of the U.S. recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The official is also calling for other Arab leaders to decline a meeting with Pence. The vice president is expected to visit Israel and the West Bank later this month. Wildfires continue to burn across Southern California. The blazes are forcing a wave of new evacuations and shutdowns on major roadways. More than 2,000 firefighters have been deployed. Authorities have warned that conditions could actually get worse. British Prime Minister Theresa May hasn't given up on meeting this week's EU deadline for coming up with Brexit proposals. She's preparing another plan on what the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland would look like after Brexit. 
May's run into opposition from her own cabinet and political backers in Northern Ireland as well. European Council President Donald Tusk will reportedly make an address tomorrow morning. The Wall Street Journal reports the buyer of that $450 million painting that da Vinci created at Christie's is Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The journal cited U.S. government intelligence and a Middle Eastern art world figure familiar with the purchase. Christie says the Salvatore Mundi will be displayed at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg, and more of Bloomberg Technology is next. Technology, I'm Emily Chang. In 2014, Amazon introduced the Echo, a new category of device designed around your voice. The Echo and Alexa with it was initially only available to invited Amazon Prime members. That all changed in June 2015 when both the Echo and Alexa were introduced to the general public, bringing AI into our living rooms and sparking competition between tech titans. We caught up with Amazon Vice President and Head Scientist at Alexa, Rohit Prasad, for an exclusive interview and asked how many skills Alexa will have in five years. So the set of skills will continue to improve daily convenience as we know it. As you can see, uh, everything is changing in terms of the behaviors of how we interact with Alexa. You set your alarms and timers through Alexa. You listen to your music through Alexa. You control your smart devices through Alexa. Uh, next, what you'll find that we are uh, transforming from more natural transactions to more deep conversations. Uh, if you look at this, we have been working on, uh, with, together with universities, what we call the Alexa Price Competition, where the goal is to build social bots that can talk to you for 20 minutes in coherent and engaging fashion. This is incredibly hard. Even if, as a human in a, uh, in a party, at a party where you have to talk to a stranger, 20 minutes is a very hard barrier to beat. So are you focused then on making Alexa more human-like and more conversational? Absolutely. We are focused on making Alexa smarter every day and human-like as well. Uh, from that perspective, we are looking into how Alexa can understand many different types of context. One of the common contexts that is human-like, that humans, we as humans are able to do quite well, is how we carry information from the previous turn. So if I said, play uh, what's the first album from Adele and then play it, uh, then you know the reference is the first album from Adele. Uh, similarly, context comes in various forms in terms of geographical and, uh, and regional context. If you're saying, uh, when are the Spurs playing next? Uh, we mean Spurs in, uh, in the U.S., it will mean the San Antonio Spurs, whereas in U.K., it will mean the soccer uh, team Tottenham uh, Spurs. So these are the s some ways we are already making Alexa smarter, and this will just keep getting better and better. Uh, do you think you'll be able to figure out how to get Alexa to understand when you're talking to her rather than when you're talking about her? Absolutely. So that's something we are also working on uh, in terms of differentiating uh, when you're intending to speak to Alexa. And you already see some of that happening when you say Alexa uh, in a different context when it's not meant for uh, the device to listen in. Uh, then it, will wake, it may wake up because you said the same word, uh, but then it will automatically shut the audio stream knowing that you use the word in a different context and you didn't mean to intend to Alexa. But, but that's, a, again, a hard problem even us for as humans to differentiate when your name is mentioned in a conversation. But we are working on that. What we're also doing is uh, what we call personal context, that Alexa now 
can differentiate who is speaking to her. Uh, so whether it's your, you or your wife, so when you play your playlist, uh, that it plays, when you ask to play your playlist, it plays your playlist rather than your wife's. Or, or when you're looking to shop, then it knows that it's you're authorized to shop uh, on Alexa and it doesn't need to ask you for a pen. What trends are you seeing in how customers are using this to shop and, and what are you doing to encourage them to shop more aside from simply discounts? Alexa is about improving daily convenience. Uh, as part of everything we are doing to improve daily convenience, uh, shopping is of course an important aspect, but it's not the only aspect. Uh, one of the things uh, as our tenant in general is to reduce friction or, uh, or to make uh, interactions as seamless as possible with Alexa. So where we are seeing uh, uh, that happen very well, if you are trying to buy uh, the daily consumables or in terms of uh, like if you said Alexa reorder batteries or Alexa order batteries those are working very seamlessly and, and now with uh, uh, with devices like Echo Show uh, we are also making it possible for you to look at what you're buying and if you said Alexa buy a blue shirt you can see the blue shirt on the screen uh, multiple options that are available and then browse just by voice or select by just by voice which makes it seamless to also buy things uh, and making it easier when you're looking at stuff that needs to be on the screen for you to make the decision. I'm curious about privacy. What information is Alexa collecting and keeping and then allowing developers to access? So privacy is first of all very important to us. Our uh, entire tenant is based on being very transparent with our customers. Uh, so in terms of, I would start with first, if you uh, look at how the interactions happen with Alexa, uh, Alexa only listens for the wake word on the device, nothing else. It's looking for that particular snippet of what you said which sounds like Alexa. And then uh, only when it's confident that an, uh, a wake word was spoken, uh, then it starts streaming to the cloud and you'll see with clear visual indicators that uh, on an echo, for instance, the light ring comes on. On an echo show, you see a light bar uh, with blue ring uh, around it on the screen, which makes it very transparent. What we've also made clear is that uh, customers can go to their application uh, in the companion application that is on your smartphone or through available through your web interface. You can go and look at every utterance that uh, you've spoken to Alexa uh, that's been recorded in our cloud services uh, and then you can choose to delete them or delete all of them uh, is, is an option for you and the reason those uh, that audio data is collected is for uh, for making our services better for you, the customers I'm curious about partnerships you have a partnership with Microsoft what can you tell us about the potential for more partnerships uh, when we spoke to Tony Reed who also works on Alexa she said anything's possible when it comes to uh, a partnership with Apple or even Google, for example. As Tony spoke to you before, uh, we are very open to partnering. Uh, we know we, uh, that our customers would want different choices. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, our partnership with Microsoft, we are making it uh, easy for Microsoft uh, customers who use Cortana to talk to Alexa and vice versa. So we are very open to uh, this kind of partnership because we want the best experiences for our customers. And how do you view the competitive landscape? Because, you know, some people are, you know, ha having rave reviews about Google Home. The HomePod from Apple is coming out next year um, and it's getting more crowded. Yeah, I think it's great that uh, so many people and companies are interested in this space. I think that's great for our customers. Uh, but at Amazon, we view we are very customer centric, and we work back from our customer needs. Uh, we have been privileged to have uh, um, millions and millions of customers using Alexa every day. Uh, that has given us uh, clear needs that we need to solve for our customers, so we are focused on that. Uh, I'd also point out that uh, uh, we are essentially a voice first uh, as interaction paradigm, and that's where our focus is. And our mission is to get Alexa everywhere, uh, in homes, in cars, in, on the go, and now even in, uh, in workplace. You did just announce Alexa for business. What do you think is the potential for Alexa in a work context? I think the potential in workplace is huge. Uh, if you think about a simple task like how much, uh, how many steps you do 
to start a meeting uh, you'll, uh, and how many times you fumble on your conference phones, uh, it's quite a lot. And now you can just say, Alexa, start my meeting and you're, you're connected uh, with everyone that's supposed to be uh, on the conference. So that's just a simple example. Uh, but even in terms of uh, through the ability to add new skills, you can build new skills for the uh, workplace uh, where you can order your office supplies, uh, you can uh, you know order a new printer cartridge, for instance. Uh, everything is possible. I think the workplace is where, just like if you look at the daily convenience, uh, workplace is an important part where you spend a, a huge amount of hours. And if every step we could make be easier and seamless, I think the adoption for Alexa and how much it can improve daily convenience for our customers will just keep getting better. And how many scientists do you have working on Alexa now? <laughs> so we have uh, several hundred scientists working on Alexa, uh, and uh, and uh, and we, I think we look at it more from the perspective of that we have so many important challenges to start uh, to solve, and it is still very early in the space of conversational AI. And as I mentioned with uh, initiatives like Alexa Prize, uh, that the potential and the societal impact of conversational AI and AI in general is going to be massive. Uh, so we want to train more scientists. And one of the things we are doing with Alexa Prize is to make sure we can partner with academia to further uh, add more interest in academia and university students, especially people going for graduate studies, uh, that we can have more scientists who want to work in this area. Now, I can't let you go, Rohit, without asking about HQ2. What is the likelihood that it will be in Boston where you are? <laughs> I wish I could tell you that, but I'm, uh, I'm not the right person for that, and uh, I have no additional information than what you see. The mystery will go on about HQ2. Amazon Vice President and Head Scientist at Alexa, Rohit Prasad. Still ahead, Jakarta-based Gojek has its eyes on an IPO, our exclusive with the CEO, and how he is fending off competition from Uber and Grab. Next, this is Bloomberg. Gojek is facing growing competition from Grab and Uber in Southeast Asia, but its CEO, Nadim Makarem, isn't concerned. He says SoftBank's investment in Uber doesn't matter right now. Grand declared 2018 as the year his company's payment platform will take off. Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann spoke with him exclusively from the year ahead Asia Summit in Jakarta and asked about the competition. I think it is, it is one of the most uh, uh, epic and innovating battles uh, in Southeast Asia. They are incredibly, uh, uh, they're both incredible companies for us to compete with. It's an honor to compete with them, uh, with the best technology in the space of ride hailing and the largest regional kind of juggernaut with the most amount of funding. Uh, it's, an, it's an incredible challenge to have for Gojek and a big reason why Gojek got to where it is today is because we have been pushed to our limits. So we had to hyper innovate in order to adapt. Um, and we came up on top in Indonesia as a result of that competition and the, the urge and hunger to, to innovate. You mentioned that they are encroaching into a lot of your market share of as well as the services that you're providing. Does it force Gojek itself to change your strategy? No, actually, I don't think. I think our strategy was designed to be resilient against giants. So our, our, our entire product strategy, our entire uh, competitive strategy is designed around flexibility, hyper diversification, and mitigating risk, right? Because we have so many different verticals that interrelate with each other, it's very hard to deal with this animal called Gojek. You think you're competing with us on ride hailing, but actually you're competing with us on the user that uses food and ride hailing. You think you're competing on food, and then you realize that, wait a minute, this is a digital wallet player that is leveraging that uh, in order to, to uh, further reinforce its food and transport business. So we are a very difficult animal to guess. Uh, and as a result of that, um, it's a little bit of that business jujitsu that we have. Uh, that's how we survive and come up on top against the, some of the largest companies in the world. Your payment system, you said, is going to grow aggressively. What are the plans for 2018, especially given the fact that this is becoming a very crowded and competitive market as well in this part of the region, with the yes. likes of Grab, uh, yeah, Lippo Group, as well as Ascend Money, really diving into this right now? Sure, sure. Um, 
ha just to address that point, we're actually the only large tech player in Indonesia that has a uh, 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 e-money license, right? That, at that scale, that is a pure tech player, just a pure tech player. So, so we're one of the few, and so the rest of our large players in Indonesia don't yet have an e-money license. So that's a, a a good advantage in terms of having some lead time to further expand. So we're ahead of the curve a lot, but obviously competition will come in, and we're fully expecting it, and we're embracing competition because that's what makes our product great. So I think that. 2018 will be the year of GoPay for Gojek. And that is when GoPay uh, acceptance uh, travels outside of our app ecosystem and starts being accepted in a variety of offline establishments, uh, in a variety of online establishments. So you're going to see 2018 as the year of partnerships. There's a very, very long queue of uh, partners that are, are trying to integrate to GoPay right now. What do you make of the investment that SoftBank has had and made on Uber? Mm -hmm. Could that lead to more consolidation in Southeast Asia? I think that for us, it is extremely important to have the integrity to pursue our product vision, and that's the only way that we're always going to be two steps ahead, by beating to our own drum. So it doesn't really matter right now. We've always been the underdog in terms of funding. We've always been the underdog in terms of resource, and we've still come up on top. So it's not about how much funding you have. It's really not. It's about how hungry you are to create exceptional product experiences. That was Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann there with Gojek's CEO. Coming up, the seedy underbelly of Silicon Valley's holiday parties in the midst of a wave of sexual misconduct allegations in tech. Next, this is Bloomberg. Another woman has come forward accusing venture capitalist Shervin Pishavar of sexual harassment. Author and entrepreneur Laura Fitton is the first to go on the record since Bloomberg's report last week. Fitton claims Pishavar aggressively kissed her and made repeated unwanted advances after a 2011 charity event. Pishavar's attorney has denied the allegations. Pishavar is also involved in a suit against Definers Public Affairs, whom he says orchestrated a smear campaign against him. Definers asked a judge to dismiss the complaint. Pishavar's lawyers have also subpoenaed Uber employee Austin Geit to testify as a witness in the suit. Bloomberg had reported that Pishavar groped Geit at a party in 2014. Now, amidst this wave of allegations of sexual misconduct in Silicon Valley, a long-standing tech tradition is being scrutinized. Tech firms are known for hiring models to run their trade booths to be greeters and such at trade conferences and shows. But this year, those requests are changing in, in a dubious way. Tech companies all over the valley are quietly paying $50 to $200 an hour for attractive models to chat up attendees, making them sign non-disclosure agreements and even having them pretend to be friends with employees. This is happening in record numbers according to local modeling agencies and it's all coming out against a backdrop of a wave of allegations of sexual assault and harassment in the Valley and beyond. So does Silicon Valley just not get it? I'd like to bring in Bloomberg Tech Sarah Fire who's been covering this story for us. Fantastic piece out by you today. Disturbing to say the least, infuriating as well. What is happening here? So companies are trying to retain these engineers that are so difficult to recruit, that are mostly men, and they're trying to add a little bit of, of excitement to their holiday parties by employing models to chat up their employees. And this has been going on for quite a while. Like you said, there's a long-standing relationship between models and tech in terms of the hype cycle, the product launches, the conferences. What's changed is this year, more than ever, there's this behind-the-scenes model like you, it's, it's not it's not that uh, accepted to be so out there about using your models as, as booth babes at CES, for example. But if you secretly hire them and tell them not to tell your employees that they were paid, then it can make for a great party. And these models are what? Checking coats or they're just mingling? What are they doing? Increase, well, so it's, it's more common in the past that say if you wanted to have like a 1920s themed party, you'd hire a bunch of models to dress in, you know, flapper attire just to really boost the theme. That's happened for ages. This is different. This is models coming, pretending that they're guests and saying, you know, if, if you were to come up to me at the party and say, oh, you know, what team are you on? Oh, I'm just a friend of a friend or I heard about the party and decided to come along. They're not supposed to say that they're hired to be there. You're saying this is happening at Facebook and Google sized companies. Is this happening at Facebook and Google? 
Well, I, I pursued this story based on a tip about a party uh, from one of those companies. <laughs> um, Facebook told me that when it hires models, it's not for this kind of atmosphere modeling. They have jobs like hostessing, serving. Um, Google did Does that make it any respond. better? Um, <laughs> well, it depends who you talk. I mean, these companies are, are throwing events not just for their own employees, but also at trade shows. And I, I was speaking, this isn't in the story, but I was speaking with modeling agencies that are getting ready to staff up parties at CES. And sometimes companies doing CES parties hire many, many more models than they would just for an employee party, because that's the part where you're trying to impress clients, vendors, sell products. Uh, sell products. And so that, it, that, that gets you more in the, the Hollywood line of work, where I talked to one atmosphere model who's gone to these parties and has also in her past done movie premieres, for example. Atmosphere models. Atmosphere models. It's a new term, I guess. Did you coin that? <laughs> oh no, I learned about that. Okay. I learned okay. about that in the course of this reporting. Sarah Fryer, great piece by you. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Dogged reporting by Sarah Fryer there. Uh, and that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We'll be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.